we're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I'm the Partnerships and Community Manager here at All Voices. Today, I'm really excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Guy Primus. He is the CEO of Valence Community. Guy, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll start um, by saying, yeah, again, Guy Primus, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you're yeah, really excited about being here uh, and talking to you. Uh, pronouns, he, him, and his. Um, you know, that's been been that way for, for a while, but, you know, it's, uh, I would say that um, kind of growing up in Pittsburgh, uh, you know, is a blue collar town and things are a certain way, right? And, and they're, you know, they've been that way since Andrew Carnegie came in and uh, dominated the city and, you know, built a bunch of housing for the people that worked in the steel mills. And, you know, the, the um, you know, I would say the blue collar mentality has a lot of benefits, right? The, the work ethic is fantastic in Pittsburgh and, and you know, like a big Steelers fan and it's all about, you know, kind of hard nose and smash mouth football, right? That, that's what the city is about. Um, but that being said, it doesn't always leave a lot of room for people that don't um, kind of fit the, the kind of typical, uh, you know, perspective or the view of what people have, uh, you know, in terms of individuals, professionals, uh, you know, family members, et cetera. And so, you know, it, it was actually an interesting uh, kind of time growing up in Pittsburgh. Uh, th that being said, uh, it, when I was younger, I guess it depends on, you know, how old you mean w yeah. you know, when I, I when I had that question, but I would say that um, early in my career, uh, you know, I, I decided that I wanted to be what I termed the black Ted Turner. And that was um, someone who took technology and took media and entertainment and, mm -hmm. and jammed them together. It really kind of sounds archaic to say that cable to cable and cable television was a new technology. But at the time when Ted Turner crafted that into uh, TBS and TNT and, you know, made uh, the Braves uh, America's team, uh, you know, it was, it was actually revolutionary what he was doing with that technology. And so I, I really aspired to do that. And luckily, I was able to go to school at Georgia Tech, which was right across uh, 10th Street from, from TBS. <laughs> and, and so it was really amazing. Um, but that being said, in previous iterations, um, I realized that I wanted to be an inventor, which I have the benefit of doing now, you know, the kind of uh, building products. But at some point in time, like between my first stint as a management consultant and my second stint as a management consultant, I thought I wanted to be the CEO of Toys R Us. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I love to have fun, right? I, I love, uh, you know, kind of uh, playing games and toys and like I said, building things. So it was, back then it was Lincoln Logs and Erector Sets and now it's Legos. Um, but then I, I actually had the benefit or the curse maybe of actually <laughs> uh, visiting Toys R Us as a consultant. <laughs> it's all how... Um, you know, kind of, it wasn't, it wasn't the fun of walking the aisles, I would say that, right, you know, so uh, that was, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to be when I was growing up, I, I still like to have fun, I remember um, I was a, uh, let me see, what would you call it, I, I was working the strike as, as an employee of Bell Atlantic, uh, you know, kind of, which is now Verizon, and um, I, I was, we were repairing the, the phone system in this uh, massive warehouse that was pretty much empty, and I remember walking in this door of this warehouse and having like a vision of people manufacturing my products. And so when I got to college, I wanted to be Amir Bose, right? Still technology and entertainment. Yeah. Um, and But Dr. Dre beat me to uh, kind of that vision. Uh, yeah, I'll say that. But that's uh, those are kind of three things during at various points in my career or uh, upbringing that I would say that I you know kind of wanted to be different things. Still, uh, you know, almost always uh, entertainment and, and technology uh, as I was growing up. Yeah, well, I would definitely say that you're inventing things and building things on a, on a regular basis in your current role today. So there's definitely a common thread. How do you think your personal journey has really led you up to this point to be CEO of Valence Community? Yeah, I would say that there are a few things um, that I can think of in, in answering that question. The first is that my mother is an educator mm -hmm. um, and, and she had the vision to not only become an educator and move into a really uh, you know, incredible school district, Penn Hills uh, School District, which is where I went to school, um, because she got to know the you know, superintendent of schools, and he hired her as, I think, the first Black teacher in the school district, if I'm not mistaken, or one, one of the first Black teachers. And then she moved us into that school district because she knew how uh, fantastic it was. She ended up leaving the school district and working at uh, uh, Pittsburgh Public Schools, but she uh, kind of really set the table for me and for my brother to say that, you know, kind of by hard work and education, it leads to, you know, a different path uh, to success and, you know, a more profitable path and a more, um, you know, kind of equitable path, I would say. 
Um, so that was the first thing. I think the, the second thing was uh, when I got to Georgia Tech, um, there, there's this thing called FACET, familiarization and adaptation to the surroundings and environs of tech, FACET. And um, you know, during FACET, you're, they used to sit you in this uh, auditorium and you know, like all the kids would be, you know, all the incoming freshmen would be sitting there and they would say, look to your left and look to your right. You know, and you're kind of saying hi to the people that you don't know, you know, that early in the morning. So some of them, you know, don't smell so good, you know, but you're, you're kind of sitting and looking at these guys thinking, hey, these are my compatriots and colleagues. And then they say, uh, in, in four years, when you graduate, one of you will not be here. <laughs> so basically they're saying like this huge attrition rate at Georgia Tech is 33%. And then um, I found out that, you know, it, it was actually higher for Black students and Latinx students and Native American students. And so I, you know, the, the example I use is I played intramural basketball with 14 other guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were a pretty good team. Um, you know, we, you know, kind of went, went into the championship game, but uh, it was the case where only five of the 15 of us graduated, right? So two thirds for, you know, again, a, a small sample size, but two thirds of the, the black male population at Georgia Tech that I entered Georgia Tech with, because we were all freshmen, graduated. And so, um, you know, it, it was a pretty stark contrast to even the 33% the attrition rate, you know, double the, the attrition rate for, for black males, at least, again, small sample size. Uh, but but uh, when I graduated, um, and, and I, I, you know, I remember, you know, that the bar was set really low. I remember um, my getting my first transcript. Uh, or my first, uh, you know, kind of report card, so to speak, and and looking and, and seeing that I got a C in calculus, and I cried, right? You know, it was um this, you know, hundred and and ninety pound, six foot three black guy crying because I got a C in calculus, and I didn't come out of the house for two days. And um, you know, then when I got back to campus, everyone was like, well, that's fine, you know, we grade on a curve, it's a normal distribution, and you know, C is is average, and you know, it's like, well, that's setting the bar really low. And, you know, especially th these were all the black students that were telling me that. So, you know, it wasn't, didn't sit well with me. Um, I had the opportunity when I graduated to go to work at the Office of Minority Educational Development. And one of the things that we did under the guidance of uh, Pat Creasine, who was the president of Georgia Tech at the time, and Dr. Norman Johnson, who kind of led, uh, you know, a lot of the transformation of, of Georgia Tech at the time for, for black and, and underrepresented students was to set a very, very high bar and not let people believe that we're not capable and not let us believe more importantly that we're not capable. And so I'll say the first class, this is the first time I'm telling the story. The first class of that um, you know, kind of uh, challenge program that I was a part of, the, one of the people that came into that program is a guy by the name of Andre Dickens. Andre Dickens is now the, the mayor elect of Atlanta, right? So then, and he came in saying, I wanna be mayor of, it, of the city of Atlanta. And no one told him he, sh he shouldn't do that or couldn't do that. But, you know, he, he had that expectation. We fostered that. We supported him. He's a friend. He's a fraternity brother. But more importantly, he's a leader of people. And, you know, I think um, being at the epicenter of uh, where the democracy challenge is going to happen in two and four years, or I guess a year and three years, um, you know, it's really important to have someone like Andre running that city. So, uh, but that, that's really kind of how I, I came to be CEO of Valence, is that really just focusing on the inequity and, and kind of focusing on sending a higher bar and providing people resources and connections that would facilitate their path to success. And that's what Valence does. Absolutely. I love that. Setting a high bar is really important. I appreciate you sharing your, your journey to being CEO of Valence Community as well. Can you share a little bit more around uh, the mission for folks who aren't familiar um, so they can get a better understanding of, of the company? Yeah, so our mission is to, it's very, very simple, create new paths to success for Black professionals, right? And, and there are a few things, uh, you know, kind of in that, right? A very short sentence, but, you know, the, the first thing is a path. Right, and we believe that success is not a, a destination, it's a journey, right? You've heard that before, but we really wanna focus on, you know, where is it that you aspire to be? What is the, you know, kind of, what is the path that, that uh, you know, you would use to get there? And then we wanna set milestones along the way and actually help shepherd people step-by-step step along that journey, right? It's one thing to say, hey, go do it. You, you, can, you can do it. And yes, you should be the CEO of, of X company, or it's, it's, it's great to say, hey, we're gonna educate you and we're not really sure where you're headed. You know, we're going to give you all the resources and whenever you kind of need something, come to us. That's one thing. But we really want to put those two things together to say, yes, we want to help you identify where it is that you should be. And then we want to provide the resources and the guidance along the way. So, you know, that's the path to success part. And then, um, you know, the, I would say we, we say path of success, again, because it, it is a journey. And, you know, the, the other thing that we think about is the vision uh, for valence, right? And, and so when we think about the vision, it is generations of black professionals who are skilled in the art of business. 
And it's not just kind of taking one person and making sure that he uh, or she or, or they are successful. That's important. But we want to make sure that when they reach a level of success, right, and not the final ultimate level of success that there is, you know, kind of their destination, but along the way, they reach back and pull someone along with them. They share their wisdom. They share their knowledge. And so um, you, we want to take that piece. And then as Black professionals, we realize that we have a different uh, origin story. I'll say, right, you know, kind of when it comes to, uh, you know, how we how we arrived at the table. And so we want to make sure that we pay homage to that origin story, the people that struggled and the, the shoulders of giants that we're standing on. We want to recognize those, recognize the artistic uh, talents that we bring, because, you know, we, we had to uh, be artistic to survive. We had to be super creative in order to survive. And so we want to make sure that we bring all of those things to the table. Um, and I think, you know, if, if we look at the vision uh, where we, if, if we'll know if we're successful, if um, you know, you can list the black professionals right now who have been successful, right? You know, and for me, it's Reginald F. Lewis and Ursula Burns and Ken Chenault and Arnold Donald. And then, you know, the list goes on, but then it stops, right? Mm -hmm. At some point it stops. And that doesn't happen with other, you know, kind of the majority, right? And so we want to be able to stop enumerating great black professionals, right? We, we yeah. you know, the, those who have reached the peak. And the other thing we want to do is that when, when the history of, I mentioned Andrew Carnegie, when the history of America is written, the next chapters, we want black professionals to be at the epicenter of those those developments and those innovations and those uh, you know revolutions. And so that's uh, another marker of success for us is that yes, we want individuals who are successful, we want generations who are successful, and we want some of these epic moments in American business history and culture to be uh, generated and led by black professionals. Absolutely, I love it. And especially when we're talking about generational success, the success of individuals, we need to talk about financial freedom and economic success. Um, and all of these factors as well, which is definitely historical. And we've seen some companies really look inward and say, okay, we need to do compensation reviews. And there's a large gap, um, especially between the majority um, and underrepresented communities uh, in the organization. But what is your advice for private organizations to really tangibly close that racial wealth gap uh, within their yeah. company? It, it's actually interesting because if you think about it, you're paying, you know, the workforce is both the biggest kind of asset that, that people have, but also the biggest, you know, expense in, in most cases, right? And so if you think about your ability to minimize the expense of your workforce, it could be a competitive advantage. So that's been the mindset of, well, we don't necessarily want to normalize, you know, kind of salaries, because if we can get this super talented Black woman over here, or this super talented, you know, Latinx guy over here, and he or she or they don't know that they could be making almost double what they're making or 40% more in some cases, right? You know, um, then, then we're, we're, it's a competitive advantage for us. And so I think what I would look and, and advise is that we treat this almost like a, a process, uh, you know, that we would in industrial engineering. So I graduated, uh, you know, kind of from the School of Industrial Engineering at Georgia Tech, and I actually ran the advisory board for, for that school. And um, I just remember, you know, kind of, uh, you know, my statistics classes and total quality management classes and setting up control charts and making sure that, yes, we have an average salary, right? But what is, what are the 95% confidence interval between, um, you know, a, a highly performing person and someone who is, um, you know, kind of not the highest performing individual? And let's make sure that those, uh, those things are correlated, right? So performance should be correlated to making more money, not your ability to negotiate when you come in, especially, you know, kind of for people that have been there for, for a while. And so I would say, you know, kind of a data analysis and looking at, again, performance versus compensation, looking at tenure versus compensation, and then doing, you know, in, in level, right? You know, again, we, we don't want to pay someone who is not uh, performing. We don't want to pay someone who's not doing the same job. But looking, looking at what are the, the, you know, kind of the control charts tell you about, you know, who's making what and, you know, kind of really making sure that A, they stay within that band. But if there are any anomalies within that band, making sure that you address those on an individual basis. And again, it's easy for me to say as a person of uh, kind of running a, a company of just a couple dozen people, right, including consultants, that, that's, that's pretty easy. Um, and it's a lot harder for someone like uh, Walmart. But again, the standardization is critical. And if, if you don't standardize, yes, it may be a competitive advantage in the short term, but ultimately, um, at least to disgruntled employees and, um, you know, kind of having the effects, the negative effects on your, uh, your workforce and, and their team. Uh, yeah, especially as we're talking about the great resignation, the great reshuffle, what have you, people are finding out that people are making 40% more than the other high performers. And at the end of the day, you'll lose top talent. But I 
think that it's 100% correct that you could take a data-driven approach, look at the statistics, um, and make sure you have your, your standards in place. Um, the other piece of you know, economic success um, and people feeling like they could do their best work is you know, a path for growth and feel like the company really cares about uh, the individual inside and outside of work. In Europe, right. and especially as a leader um, and a CEO, how can other leaders effectively, actively and intentionally retain top talent in today's ever-changing workplace? Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting. So I consider myself to have worked for the best that's ever done it, and that's Howard Schultz. You know, yeah. so and, and if when you read Howard's book or you talk to Howard, you realize that his background is not what you would expect it to be. Right. You know, Howard, in, in so, at some point in his uh, life was poor and, yeah. you know, his his father couldn't afford health insurance and therefore he couldn't go back to work. And, you know, it, it kind of had a negative impact on his uh, his upbringing. And I think he took that and said, you know what, I don't want that to happen to my employees. So he calls them his employees partners. Mm -hmm. He actually pays for them to go back to school in many cases. He makes sure that they, you know, even, you know, uh, working uh, not full time, they have access to health care. And this was pre-Obamacare, right? You know, so I think that that, that is, it's, it's an important thing to make sure that people have, and, and, and you think about the things that um, can lead to uh, phenomenal success investment, right? So providing data about, well, what is the average investment rate? What is the average 401k contribution? Because we as, as Black folks, like, you know, my mother worked as a teacher, my father worked at TWA, um, they both got pensions, but, you know, they, neither of them, or actually my mother did, you know, kind of through work, but my father didn't contribute to a 401k or, you know, kind of any retirement plan. And so knowing what the, the kind of average uh, you know, rates are in, of investment, because again, you don't want to do too much less than, than that. You might kind of make a conscious decision, but it's hard to make any decision if you don't have the data. And so again, that's my engineering mind talking, but that, that's one thing. The other thing to con consider is what is it, what are those catastrophic events that lead to uh, you know kind of people losing uh, their livelihood and losing their their savings, right? And and Howard saw that because he saw it happen with his father, and so he made sure that through insurance that didn't happen. It's actually interesting when you look at data and you look at um, natural disasters, and you, there's a huge disparity in terms of uh, what happens post the natural disaster. And what happens you'll see is that um, people that are black, Latinx, Native American, their wealth decreases after a natural disaster. Mm -hmm. on average. For white folks, the actually, uh, you know, net worth increases because they have insurance and are able to build back better. And, yeah. and so that actually, you know, there's data to, to suggest that and prove that, but it actually can make its way into the workforce as well. So making sure that healthcare is taken care of and, you know, disability insurance and things of that nature and, and providing access and knowledge, right? It's not just, hey, here's this list of things that you can check, but, you know, let's educate you on why this is important. Right. And we're not trying to nickel and dime you to death by taking, you know, kind of things out of your paycheck every Friday. But let's understand what's going on here and, and understand why disability insurance might be helpful. And let's understand why, you know, you might want to have a, uh, you know, be a part of an HMO vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a PPO. Right. You know, just understanding that. Right. You know, and if you have a, a specialty that you need and, and let's consider that and, and let's be honest about it. And, you know, let's just kind of understand what, what the effects of, of having made these individual decisions are. Absolutely. And I think looking at this from a historical and societal perspective is really important too. There's a ton of statistics out there and resources that you can garner from there as well. And along the same lines of being intentional um, about what we're talking about too, a lot of companies are making a shift to hire more Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC professionals, uh, which is important. But the other piece of that is talking about specific retention of BIPOC professionals, and you described a couple of these ingredients in terms of making sure they have resources, health insurance, disability insurance available, but are there any other pieces uh, that you would highlight to ensure that the workplace is, in fact, set up for folks to succeed? That, that, that sounds like a softball question to me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it. <laughs> so I, I appreciate it because one of the things that we do at Valence is actually we think about the recruitment, retention, and promotion of those Black professionals. And very, very specifically, you know, we dealt with, uh, you know, when we came out of the gate, the recruiting piece by kind of providing you know, this network of 20,000 Black professionals who are members of Valence, and then, you know, kind of ultimately hundreds of thousands um, that we are aware of that we can then connect individual employers to when they're recruiting, right? So we not, you know, for, for our members, we can provide the direct connection, but, you know, we have tens of thousands of others in our network that we can uh, make available and make uh, you know kind of employers aware of. So that's that's one thing, you know. But then on the, re the retention piece, we actually in September launched a program called Bonds, 
uh, mm. which is a fantastic. We actually hired uh, you know a woman named Tracy Williams from YPO, and you know she ran uh, some of the international programs for YPO, and we put her in charge of building a community of black professionals, emerging black professionals, because it's one thing when you're kind of in the C-suite or you're you're an executive at a company, right? You, you've made it. Um, but but what happens is a lot of us don't make it, you know, it, it to those levels, right? Disproportionately, we don't make it to those levels, right? You know, so if, if, it, if it represented college education or it represented, um, you know, the entry into the workforce or it represented, you know, the American uh, demographics, that would be one thing, but it doesn't. None of those actually represent who's in the upper, you know, kind of echelon. And then you do look at Fortune 500 companies, right? For the longest time, there have been five, four, five black you know, CEOs, right? But we represent 13% of the population. So you would expect there to be, you know, kind of, uh, you know, many more than, than five, you know, 50, 60 would be, you know, kind of incredible, right? And so we need to get there. But until we get there, you know, people want to talk about a pipeline problem. There's no, and, and I, I, don't, I don't really like that term because pipeline suggests, you know, a homogeneous process. And, it, you know, it's like a one, one in, you know, in point and one out point, right? That's a pipeline to me. I look at it as an ecosystem. And mm -hmm. for, for us, the bonds, is a really integral part of this ecosystem of, uh, you know, the bonds program, I should say, really integral part of this ecosystem because we need to educate the individuals who are coming through this, uh, you know, kind of this ecosystem to make sure they know what is expected of them and they're prepared. And so we focus on uh, three Cs. We focus on community. So again, we provide, you know, this really incredible safe space for these right now 150 black professionals going on, you know, kind of by the end of the year, uh, kind of 600 black professionals in 2022, we hope to have 600 or so black professionals going through this program um, and, and then on, on to thousands. But imagine a safe space where all of those black professionals can share their trials and tribulations and what to look out for. And then we actually sprinkle in some what we call beacons, which are members of the community that, that really have a vested interest in making sure that those individuals succeed. They might be black professionals who are reaching back and have made it, right? You know, so people like Rodney Atkins and Ann Sampowski Ward and Michael Armstrong, you know, kind of who are all uh, friends of mine, you know, who, who are sit on boards and, you know, kind of have a different perspective because they've gone through this process and they understand what it takes. But it's also uh, people like, you know, Laura uh, O'Connor Hodgkin, who is uh, Stacey Abrams' business partner at Now Account or Now Corporation Now. And, you know, kind of having her be a, you know, a non BIPOC individual who understands and kind of can relate and actually has a business partner who is running for the governor of Georgia that actually can provide a different perspective and making sure that that is shared with, uh, you know, the members of the committee. So I'm uh, Brad Gerstner, who's a friend of mine who started the board challenge, you know, co-founded the board challenge with me. Uh, Steven Savagian, who is, you know, CEO of Anova Culinary, which is part of Electrolux. They all have a different perspective and they're willing to share that with the community. So that community element is very important. But as I mentioned, the curriculum and making sure that um, you know, people are aware of what it takes and, and making sure that they know how to use their authentic voice in, in terms of public speaking and understanding, you know, what their strengths are. So we do, we start off with a strengths finder assessment, you know, kind of, and, and making sure that people understand what they're good at and what they're not good at and how they fit into a team and, you know, kind of, you know, again, bringing their authentic self to work, but uh, a functional look at that, right? You know, so we have the curriculum, we have the community, but then we combine something that, you know, I'm 52 years old, um, I have a Harvard Business uh, School education. I have two engineering degrees, but I'd never had executive coaching until uh, probably about two months ago. And so we bring executive coaching to that whole mix. And so you have someone who's an advocate for you and knows your innermost secrets uh, and, and your kind of uh, your challenges in, in, in your professional journey, and they can help you help you navigate that. So that's what the bonds program is, and it's something that you know we don't take lightly. I, I, I look at this as being a Gladwellian moment for Black professionals. And that is that we have 158 going on 600, you know, going on thousands of members uh, of the bonds community. And I predict that in 10 years, when you look back at who are the, the kind of next tier of, you know, black leaders, you know, the, the next, uh, the, the, you know, the next journey, uh, you know, kind of that, that's going to be reaching back. Um, those will be the members of the bonds program. And so that's really, it's exciting. It's daunting to be kind of leading that program, but it's really incredibly talented people that are members. Um, uh, 47 companies who are supporting these journeys of these this first cohort and of founding members. And, you know, so I, that, that's really something that I think that, um, you know, again, if it's the bonds program, fantastic. There are other programs out there. I'm happy to, you know, kind of point anyone in the right direction because it doesn't have to be one size fits all. Although, you know, we, we feel that this unisex one size fits all version that we're uh, kind of providing through mass customization is perfect for many 
uh, you know, dozens and thousands of members of the of the Black professional community. Absolutely. Resourcing and really intentionally investing in Black professionals at companies is really important. And we're talking about strategies for talent attraction, retention, employee engagement, um, whether it's positive, negative, anything in between, people are going to have feedback as well. Um, and I really want to ask you in terms of the companies you work with and what you're seeing out in the world, how you see employee feedback management as an important tool to really proactively build a culture of trust um, and listening. We know this is where innovation is happening at thriving organizations. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think um, one of the most important things is um, criteria that are well understood and that really don't have uh, bias infused into them, right? So a lot of analytical processes, unfortunately, and you could talk about artificial intelligence, you know, the human intelligence goes into coding all of that, right? You know, so yes. I'm a beneficiary of um, that because my mother was a teacher and I remember she was working on her master's degree. So she had this book called Miller's Analogies that, um, you know, she's a, you know, it basically was um, one of the components, main components of the SAT. So I did really well on the SAT. My brother did even better. Um, you know, so we, we benefited from that type of, um, you know, I'll, I'll call it, you know, that, that analysis of, of the individual, uh, you know, pre, pre-college. Um, and that, you know, kind of has been shown to be biased. And now a lot of companies are, are or excuse me, not companies, um, you know, Freudian slip there. A lot of uh, colleges are looking at doing away with um, the SAT and GRE and GMAT and, you know, kind of other standardized tests. If you think that your process is standardized, um, I would say think again, right? You know, I, I think it's really, really important to understand that uh, probably a lot of those uh, you know, pieces of analysis are, are biased. Um, and, and, you know, really, um, you know, OKRs and KPIs are, are critical. And, you know, making that be what people are, are judged on and maybe not their teamwork or their kind of, you know, things of that nature. Because, you know, it's really hard to be part of a team when no one wants you to be there, right? And, and again, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of a little hyperbole there. But, you know, understanding that a lot of us who come with our, uh, you know, kind of backgrounds and our authentic selves to work, uh, you know, a lot of times there's imposter syndrome, but there's also this kind of wearing the veil, um, you know, kind of that uh, W.E. Du Bois and, you know, Paul, uh, you know, Lawrence Dunbar talk about, you know, kind of wearing a mask and, and not being able to be who you are at work and then, you know, needing to fit in and being uncomfortable in your skin at, while you're at work. And so I would say that, you know, the things that are um, really uh, predictors of success for business success let's stick to those kind of really those, you know, kind of uh, those measures and let's measure individuals on those. But, you know, the things that are more, um, you know, kind of uh, subjective, like let, let's get rid of those things. And, and again, it's, a, it's really important to take a look at, you know, what that is. Again, teamwork, you know, would you have a beer with this person? Well, some people, you know, especially in the black community, they don't drink beer. Hey, right? you know, there are a lot, a lot of the folks are church going uh, people and they're not, that's not what they're interested in. So yes, you're probably not going to want to have uh, you know, a beer with that black woman who, you know, kind of spent her, you know, uh, formative years growing up in the black church, you know, so that that's the kind of thing that I think um, has to be weeded out and really look at the, the the core measures for success for the company and not those things that you think are good for, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, what, what it means to move forward. And then once you understand that, like, think about how you build a more inclusive process. How do you build a more inclusive company so that those individuals who really could be sources of competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis your competitors, uh, you know, kind of really can be included and uh, not only, you know, a part and, in, you know, it, it, in the kind of large I, you know, capital I inclusive nature, but actually could be a competitive advantage because they see things in a different way and making sure that, that those individuals have uh, voices that can be heard and respected and really acted upon. Absolutely. Inclusive with a capital I. I love that. Um, and thinking about core competencies and really standardizing kind of what your expectations are as well. Having that common language for a path to success is really important. I would argue, I don't want to speak for you and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but all voices and balance community exist because the system as it's set up today is not a level playing field. And I want to ask in your opinion, why it's important to also offer in this process or system an anonymous way for folks to give feedback, an important part of the strategy as well. Yeah, it's, it's actually, um, that was a, the most intriguing thing, the reason why I'm here, because I, I love that piece of, you know, kind of providing feedback. It, you know, feedback loops are important in any process, right? You know, if you're not looking at the controls, it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult to know if your process is in control. And so um, th there is the Hawthorne effect, right? You know, so my, you know, my, my industrial engineering background, uh, you know, people perform when they know they're being watched and they say things that um, 
they know that people want to hear. They perform in a certain way. And so you guys collecting feedback that allows people to um, kind of take the fear out of the process of providing feedback, right? You, you, you want to have a process that really, you know, Will Smith, you know, when I ran his production company, he used to say, um, you know, he, he would want people to speak up and not be afraid to spend money when it was necessary and not be afraid to kind of go back and redo something if it was necessary and change things and, and the status quo. And his one question was, does it make the movie better? Right. And, and, and the question should be, does this make the company better? And you should want all of the unsolicited, biased, whatever feedback that people can provide and, and understanding that, you know, the biases come from backgrounds. Right. You know, and, and none of us can pretend that we're not biased. We all are biased by our background. We can we can try to get rid of that and we can kind of, you know, um, understand what it means and, you know, kind of really be mindful. But we all have different backgrounds. And so uh, providing you guys providing a form to actually provide feedback so that all of those voices can be heard, all voices can be heard, I think is, is critical. And, and again, I never really thought about it. I mean, you know, ombuds people are, are important, um, but, you know, it, it's, um, it's unfortunate when you don't have what you, uh, you know, kind of what you guys provide, because um, people are forced to do things that they regret, right? They're forced to sign NDAs when they see something. I was listening to NPR yesterday about a story of a high school kid being you know, forced to sign NDAs and even, even when they kind of witnessed things that were illegal, right? And then, um, you know, those in, NDAs being enforceable, you know, it, it's really, you know, sad. So being able to provide a place for people to give direct, honest, open, biased feedback, because again, we're all biased, is, okay. is really, really important. Because if you have not been uh, kind of walked a mile in that individual's shoes, it's hard to understand their perspective. And so that's why I think, again, you know, we, we talk about anti-bias training, I don't, um, you know, anti-bias is, uh, you know, important in decision-making, right? But it's not important in, in, in feedback and, and input. I, I, I really believe that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely appreciate that that feedback as well. And I'm looking forward to partnering with you and the Valence community team in, in the future. So we, we have some really good things uh, in the mix, but I want to ask what you're looking forward to most about our upcoming uh, and continuous partnership. I mean, I, I think that for me, um, as like, again, as an industrial engineer, as a CEO of a company that we hope will be a unicorn, uh, a decacorn, yes. uh, centicorn company, you know, kind of as we go forward, yeah. um, it, it really is, is important to um, collect information and collect data, right? You know, that, that's something that I've been uh, doing. And, you know, I, even before I understood what I was doing, um, because of my ADHD, uh, you know, kind of undiagnosed. I actually was um, processing information in a much different way than my um, counterparts. So, you know, I would count steps, you know, for instance, and I would, you know, I know that, you know, I've been in my grandmother's house in 30 years, but I can tell you there are 16 steps in her yeah. house. There are three steps, there are 10 steps, and there are six steps to get to the second floor. So in my mind, if there's ever a fire, I'm, I can run down these steps faster than anyone, right? You know, and, and in my house, there were 12 steps. You know, I can tell you how many there were, you know, kind of, it would take me 45 seconds to walk a city block in New York. All of those data to me are important because I can tell you how long it takes me to get across town. You know, I, I could calculate it. And so I think for, for me, feedback and data are really, really critical. And so I'm looking forward to understanding our company more. I'm under, looking forward to understanding kind of best practices in other companies and, you know, just really understanding, again, on, obviously anonymized, but, you know, kind of really understanding what is it that uh, sets us apart? What is it that we need to work on? And what is it that, um, you know, if, if we do better, you know, we, we knock the cover off the ball and become that decacorn, centicorn uh, company that I know that that balance can be. Absolutely. And I think we do have similar mission and visions for the workplace as well, for the future of leaders. And I want to ask, in your opinion, too, again, as a leader and a CEO and with all of your experiences, what you think a must have for the next generation of leaders to have uh, to be successful in the future, knowing what we know now, knowing there's no crystal ball, but uh, what is your advice there? Yeah, I would say that um, for leaders, right? You know, I, I really believe teams are made up of individuals and those individuals um, a lot of times are flawed and they have, again, you know, I, I look at my son. My son is an incredible mind. Um, he has profound ADHD, but, you know, he has this incredible memory and he has the ability to kind of synthesize data in ways that most of us don't, don't really see. And he's, he does it really quickly. I wouldn't put him in charge of kind of running and, um, uh, you know, kind of an operations, you know, being a COO, because that's not his, his forte. And so, you know, I think that understanding, it, it's important for the leaders to understand that even if someone doesn't fit a traditional, you know, uh, 
Ivy League edu educated, uh, you know, kind of engineering mind, process orientation, uh, you know, that, that they can be very, very beneficial to the company. And then understanding how do you put those things together and synthesize them in a way that really resembles alchemy. You know, mm -hmm. so how do you kind of take, uh, you know, kind of something that, uh, you know, a, a lot of people would reject, um, you know, but, you know, really, if you put them into the right system and you put them, give them the right role and the right guidance and the right data and, and the right information and understand that that individual has something to contribute and actually can, again, really make more uh, than the sum of its parts. I, I think that's really what I'm looking for. And again, that that really uh, comes in the form of neurodiversity, which I just addressed addressed through ADHD, yeah. um, you know, kind of tr traditional, uh, you know, kind of uh, ethnic diversity, right? You know, kind of understanding people have different backgrounds, understanding that the Black community, the Latinx community, you know, AAPI is not a monolith. Like we all have a lot of different backgrounds and you see it on, on display every day here in Los Angeles. Um, but but also, you know, kind of, uh, you know, gender orientation and sexual orientation, I think, is, is really important as well, because, um, you know, understanding that not everyone sees things in a, in a you know, this, the same way. And, yeah. you know, not that you have to follow someone's guidance necessarily, but be able to process the data, process the information and synthesize, again, in a, in a process that I think will resemble, resemble alchemy to, to people from the outside looking in, but really is formulaic, if you, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. It is formulaic. It doesn't just happen because you will it to happen or you want to be a good leader. You need to have these conversations and really put all the puzzle pieces together as well and use the data that is at your fingertips. Guys, is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to share or one to two key insights you want to underscore, highlight, bold, um, italicize for our listeners to bring back? <laughs> well, I, I want to start by saying uh, I, I appreciate your ability to synthesize some of my uh, points. <laughs> Hopefully they were coherent before you yes. synthesize them, but you definitely, you know, kind of made me want to take notes on, you know, kind of uh, some things. So you did a fantastic job and I, I really appreciate that. I'm actually looking forward to collaborating with you because again, we have our mission and we have, um, you know, a really great framework that we know works for individuals yes. and ultimately will work for generations. But, you know, there are a lot of components that, you know, as, as we scale that we will look to build but there are many more that we'll look to partner with. And it's, it's really exciting to kind of uh, be in this budding uh, partnership and relationship with you. And, and I just, uh, I would encourage people to, um, you know, if not bonds, uh, you know, kind of for your emerging black executives, just look at some options. You know, there are executive coaching options, there are curriculum options, there are programs by, you know, major consulting firms. I think we do it better than anyone because ours is much more culturally relevant than, than most. Um, it, it really considers the, um, you know, again, not just the, the end product, but the, you know, kind of background and, and, you know, kind of perspective that we have. But I would encourage people to look at those type of development programs and communities for their entire employee base, not just Black professionals, not just women, uh, you know, not just AAPI, not just LGBTQ, not just Latinx, but their entire population, um, you know, even some of the people that don't fit into, you know, none of the above, right? If, if I start enumerating all of the yeah. underrepresented, underappreciated, uh, you know, kind of uh, underincluded communities. Um, there's this this group <laughs> that that is out there, and they need to they need to be uh, kind of shepherded too, right? Mm -hmm. They need they need guidance and they need assistance. And so I think you know we're actually developing an allies program at Valence, um, you know that that helps people recognize um, all of the uh, you know kind of many uh, you know aspects and, and ingredients in this melting pot that we call the United States, and understanding um, you you don't have to be one of the you know kind of outlying uh, you know, kind of communities. You can be an ally for the change and the development and ultimately the success of companies and, and the society. Absolutely. Allyship is really important, especially for everything that we talked about as well and including folks in the conversation. Guy, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in that intentional employee feedback management as a requirement for the company to succeed overall. Have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone.